So this week with Charlie Wilson's War, we kind of find an American story, but it is ultimately about Afghanistan. And Congressman Charlie Wilson, played by Tom Hanks, kind of gets, oh, not roped in isn't the right word, but he kind of basically comes to realize how much the U.S. might be able to help the Afghans against the Soviets. And this is all during the Cold War. So we kind of are right in 1980 in our timeline here. And I'm going to let you kind of take the lead. This is a one of your kind of favorite movies, and I had just seen it for the second time, whereas you kind of said you almost kind of even had it memorized. <laughs> so Yes, yeah, I, I probably didn't need to rewatch it, but, you know, I did just because I really like this movie. But, yeah, I, I love the uh, the dialogue is awesome. There's, a, of course... It is Aaron Sorkin. Aaron Sorkin screenplay. It's uh, some awesome performances by uh, Tom Hanks, and uh, especially Philip Seymour Hoffman is awesome in this. Julia Roberts is is fine. And then kind of a, I don't know how early it was in her career, but Amy Adams is like a supporting role in this, which I I don't think she'd probably be playing a role like this today. She's probably got a little more star power, but this is... Right, did kind of surprise me, but she, I think she was already Oscar nominated at that point, but she still was still... Oh, was she? Well, so she was, her first kind of breaking onto the scene was a, a small movie called Junebug, and that probably predated this. And then so this was, but that was like a supporting role in an independent film. And then I think she started getting supporting roles in mainstream films, even though she had that Oscar nomination. Yes. Yeah, so, okay. Junebug was 06 or sorry, 05. So, and then she got nominated in Dow a year after this. So this is kind of the okay. beginning of her rise into mainstream after, even though she did have an Oscar nomination in her pocket, she was like an, almost like Jennifer Lawrence after Winter's Bone before yeah. she had broke big, big. Yeah. And then also uh, just another casting observation, which I don't think I noticed this until it was probably like two or three times ago that I saw this. But I was like, oh, my gosh, Emily Blunt's in this movie. Right. She's like cute girl that is going to sleep with the congressman. She's in it for, like I don't know, maybe three or four minutes total screen time. Right. Is she actually probably like a call girl or an escort. No, 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 no. She's uh, she's the daughter of one of the guys. So, some guy comes to talk to Charlie Wilson at the beginning of the movie. Like it's one of his constituents and he brings his daughter along. And the daughter is Emily Blunt. Okay, but she did still sleep with him. And and she didn't really have a scene outside of that, so... No, no, yeah. no. There, she's not, like, a character. She's right. just, like, you know, a very tiny little role, but, yeah. Yeah, the cast is amazing. And it, it, Philip Seymour Hoffman, again, is one where it's just... Oh, my gosh. I'll watch anything he's in, man. He's, talk about a legend. I, I still feel like he's underrated. With the general population, he's underrated. So, yes, people in the industry and big kind of movie fans that kind of get into the nitty gritty of Oscar stuff like you and I are big yeah. fans. But I feel like to your general moviegoer, they're like, oh, yeah, I recognize that guy. It's like, no, no, no. He's one of the greatest actors ever. And he's so good at small performances. He mumbles his way through this movie while also shouting in certain scenes. And it's just so perfect. Yeah. And he is uh, he's one of those actors kind of like Gary Oldman. That's the exact comparison I was thinking of. He's a chameleon. Like, he can completely transform himself into whatever role. Like, if you look at him in this versus, like, his role as, like, the villain in Mission Impossible 3 versus him playing, like, Truman Capote, it's, like, right. it's insane that that's the same guy. Right, right. I would say Gary Oldman is probably the best comparison. Oh, yeah. I love watching, like, uh, you can go find, like, uh, you know, YouTube compilations where people will, you know, put together, like, Gary Oldman's, like, best acting moments in, like, his different roles. And, I mean, even to, even if you've never seen the movies before, just watching him work is awesome. And Philip Seymour Hoffman is the same way. Yeah. So, yeah, so our, our story here, and again, it's, I suppose it's fairly accurate, right? As far as what he had to go through to kind of get the funding, to bring the attention, to basically give the Afghan people the... The help they needed, right? Yeah, and it's it uh, it's it's actually based off of a book. And actually, before we get to that, let me rewind real quick. And it actually, kind of seems silly me giving a rundown of the history of Afghanistan when exactly one of the two of us spent a year in Afghanistan, and it was not me. But <laughs> uh, so going way back, so we've been here ish before. We've been in this part of the world before, but I don't think we've actually had a movie directly set in Afghanistan to the extent that this one is. Yeah, I don't think so. Unless, unless maybe like one of your, I don't know, any of your ancient history. Well, it's like Genghis Khan was in Afghanistan, but we didn't necessarily have a movie set in that. You know what I'm saying? We weren't specifically in Afghanistan. Of course, all it was sure. It didn't necessarily have the, even the same identity. But it is kind of like when we talked about 
the Khmer people in Cambodia. Same kind of thing. You have the Afghans in this area, and it's even called Afghanistan because it's the land of the Afghans. But it's been this interesting crossroads. It's kind of unique in that it's completely landlocked, and it's just right in the middle of everything. So everybody has had their thumb in Afghanistan for thousands of years. So going way back... It's been called... uh... I was going to say it's it's been called the the graveyard of empires because of the number of major powers over I mean literally thousands of years. Right. Basically, everybody but the Romans had was there at some point. It sounds like. Yeah. Exactly. So it's actually kind of the center though of uh, Zoroastrianism back in the day, and that does still exist to some extent. I do think I've talked about it on previous episodes, but that actually kind of had its center in Afghanistan. It seems. Uh, then they were conquered by the Persians, but then when the Persians were conquered by Alexander the Great and the Greeks, that included up into Afghanistan, and there were, and actually I don't think still are necessarily, but there were Greek cities in Afghanistan, and just so many influences all at the same time here. The Greeks, the Zoroastrians, the Buddhists from India, and, and Hindus from India, and then after all that, then the Western Chinese come in, because of course China borders it too, like it's just everything's connected here, yep. um, and just back and forth control and then the Arabs come in with Islam and it took 150 years for them to kind of subdue the Afghan population. But yes, ultimately they were converted to Islam and remain that to this day. But then even after that, you get into more Persian influence. Then about that time, the Mongols come kicking the door down and then the country's kind of split between Indian, Persian and Turkish control. And very briefly, the Afghans actually kind of managed to take over Persia and knock back a little bit, but that didn't last very long. That was about the 1700s. Then you get into the British, and the mm-hmm. British kind of wanted, about the time the British had India, Afghanistan was kind right. of in a spot where they wanted a buffer between them and the Russians. And yes. incidentally, something we did not get into in our timeline here at all, because it is fiction, but in Sherlock Holmes, when Dr. Watson comes back to Britain and meets Sherlock Holmes, Dr. Watson just got back from being a doctor in Afghanistan. Right. So that's kind of how long that we've, you know, the Western world has been kind of over there. Yeah. And so Afghanistan was, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that they were, I mean, even during like, like World War One, they were uh, basically a buffer between the Russians and the, the British. And that lasted pretty much all the way up until Afghanistan gained its independence in 1919, I think it was. Yeah, that, that, all, that all sounds about right. And then they stayed neutral through the cold war but then the soviets were kind of in there and helping them build up their infrastructure right well there was like between the time that afghanistan gained this independence and then the time that our basically our timeline in the movie starts there are so many like coups and this guy you know arrests and executes this guy who arrests and executes this guy and it's like you know, coup after coup and regime after regime yes. takes over until eventually they set up what was called the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan or the PDPA, which was like a communist um, government. Right. That was like, it's one of those things where it was kind of both good and bad. Like they were good and that they were, you know, moving these progressive policies, trying to, you know, get more rights for women and, uh, you know, get women into the government, but also they were like really kind of shitting on the rural population. They were, you know, saying you can only have like, you you can only grow this much of each of your crops and, you know, we're going to tax you. And the the rural population kind of saw it as a threat to their traditional way of life. So then they started to revolt and rebel. And then the communist government said, well, we can't have this. Hey, Soviet Union, come help us, you know, squash this, this rebellion. Um, which is why the Soviets invaded in 1979, and they kind of said, "Oh, well, we're not—it's not an invasion. We're not invading Afghanistan. It's just an intervention to keep the peace." And even the official Afghan government at the time saw it that way as well. Yes, but the United States and you know Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, basically all these Islamic countries said, um, "I don't. I think this is a, an invasion. You know, you're." You're threatening the freedoms of everybody. Like, yeah, you're supporting the government, but you're kind of threatening the freedoms of everybody else in in the country. And well, and another reason that the Soviets invaded in the first place was because they didn't want um, Afghanistan to end up like Iran, because Iran had just gone through an Islamic revolution and had become a you know theocracy, an Islamic theocracy, and they didn't want the same thing to happen to Afghanistan because Afghanistan actually bordered the Soviet Union. 
Um, and they thought that that, you know, sentiment might spread to even more countries. You have, you know, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, all border Afghanistan. At the time, those were all part of the Soviet Union. Oh, right. Um, so they were afraid that, the you know, that sentiment, that Islamic theocratic sentiment might spread to those countries. And then they would have even bigger problems on their hands. So they kind of wanted to nip it in the bud by invading Afghanistan. And, you know, not to jump to the end of the movie, but that's where we were so short sighted is we were so anti anything communist in Russia that we didn't think about we were ultimately helping the conservative potentially radicalizable Islamic yes. population that became yes. the Taliban or opened the door for the Taliban anyway right which we can we can probably talk about that more when we when we True. get to the end of the movie but uh yeah huge hugely short-sighted <laughs> right. on the part of the United States and and of course Philip Seymour Hoffman's character calls it says it sees it coming and yep. basically all the funding we were willing to go for and help the russians with we were not willing to help the whole nation building uh effort after that and and that's the whole people get mad to you know when we are you know using taxpayer dollars to help with efforts overseas and and i get that but it's also again it can be short-sighted it's like no 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 we're spending a billion now to save us a trillion later yes and if we had invested in Afghanistan, after the Soviets pulled out, it, it would have been a substantial investment, but the amount we would have saved on the other end is astronomical. And, oh, for sure. And that's hindsight, obviously, but there were signs that people didn't yeah. know it was going to be this way. Right. H hindsight is twenty twenty, but ultimately, you know, it, there's a good argument to be made that maybe 9-11 doesn't happen. Maybe the entire war on terror doesn't happen. If, exactly. If in 1985, 1986, you say, you know what, we're going to keep, you know, pumping money in here because at the time, well, I, I, do you want to get into this now or do you want to wait? Do you want to talk about everything leading up to well, it? Well, then... kind of both because honestly, ultimately, the whole movie is just about Tom Hanks trying to get the money to help the Afghans right. fight the Russians. And then at the end of the yeah. movie, they get the money. So like, it, it, that's really all the movie is. I don't know how much we have to break down actually Charlie yeah. Wilson's life I guess, and all that. I guess you're right. Yeah. So go it, ahead. It kinda, yeah, it's, it, I was just going to say, it starts off in 1979 with the initial invasion. And then the in the movie, it's just Tom Hanks meeting Philip Seymour Hoffman and Gus Avocados. And it's, the movie is basically them working behind the scenes to get money and then also make sure that, you know, all the pieces need to fall into place as far as getting Israel to work with Egypt and Pakistan and Saudi Arabia, you know, because obviously Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, Egypt don't like Israel, but they all decided to kind of put aside their differences and work together to fight the Soviets, you know. So they were funneling the money and weapons through Pakistan, which eventually gave the Mujahideen or the holy warriors um, in Afghanistan the... Uh, the tools that they needed to to repel the invasion and, and just make it so costly for the Soviets to stay there. And also at the same time, they were becoming more and more successful fighting the Soviets. But at the same time, in 1985, Leonid Brezhnev was replaced by Mikhail Gorbachev, who was a lot more anti-war and anti-interventionist. Um, right. And so... You know, that that was also a major factor as far as what eventually caused the, the Russians to to leave Afghanistan. But yeah, the, the movie basically ends with the Russians leaving Afghanistan and then a, you know, a kind of a, a warning from Philip Seymour Hoffman's character that the United States needed to continue to invest in Afghanistan because, you know, like, I don't know if they said this in the movie, but uh, one third of the population had either been killed or left the country. Oh, wow. And then uh, they say this, they say in the movie, they they quote the statistic that half of the country is under the age of 14. Oh, yeah, that's just that's just insane. Yeah. You know, so talk about the perfect recipe, basically a perfect storm for fundamentalism to take over. Right. Because uh, yeah, I actually just rewatched that scene this morning again on YouTube where basically, oh, what does he say? That the crazies are going to be rushing into Kandahar like it's Christmas or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Which is exactly what happened. Right. You know, you had the, the you had the Mujahideen that were backed by the United States under the command of a guy named Ahmad Shah Massoud. And then they were fighting against uh, the, basically his faction, his group wanted to have like coalition rule in Afghanistan. So basically all of these factions that, you know, had banded together to fight the Russians, they said, well, let's keep this going. Let's keep this cooperation going and run the country ourselves, you know, all together with with everybody. But there was another faction that, it, you know, eventually basically became the Taliban. I said, no, 
we're going to control. We want to control everything. We want, you know, total control. We don't want to have to share with anybody. And uh, they were getting uh, help from Pakistan. Well, before that, the, the government of Afghanistan, after the Soviets got kicked out, the government of, of Afghanistan was still getting help from the Soviets until 1991, when the Soviet Union ceased to exist. Then you had this civil war in Afghanistan between Massoud's guys and the guys who would eventually become the Taliban, who were backed by Pakistan. They eventually did control most of the country, uh, with the exception of the North, which is why that group became known as the Northern Alliance. And then, in, obviously, in 2001, 9-11 happened. Two days before that, Ahmad Shah Massoud was assassinated. Oh, huh. So then 9-11 happens, and then the Northern Alliance is the group with whose... They were the group that the United States partnered with to fight the Taliban and overthrow the Taliban in 2001 after 9-11, when the United States said, hey, kick al-Qaeda out of your country and give us Osama bin Laden, and the Taliban refused. And then obviously that's that was almost 20 years ago, and that war is still going on today. Right, which is just, yeah, just insane. Um, what's also relevant I wanted to mention is uh, I would highly recommend the two main novels by Khalid Hosseini, who is is Afghani, uh, lives over here now as a writer. So The Kite Runner, a lot of people have heard of. There was a movie on that one, too. And then also A Thousand Splendid Sons. Those kind of deal with... They're actually that... What I always talk about is like the perfect kind of historical fiction, where it's you take the actual events and then put your character... Kind of like the Dr. Shafago or Titanic thing, where you put the characters in the real-life events. So that's kind of what you get in The Kite yeah. Runner and Thousand Splendid Sons, both. And Hosseini himself like as a kid had to escape Afghanistan during like the Russian invasion and all that kind of stuff. So the guy's been through it and now he, he lives in the States and is a successful writer or anything now, but just it's very, very worth reading those books to give you a glimpse of the real life people on the ground going through all of this, both from the conflict side of things. And then we get to like a thousand splendid sons. It deals with these women. So also dealing with, you know, arranged marriages and all that kind of stuff, all against the backdrop of Soviet invasions, followed by Taliban taking over and just how these people are trying to live their lives under strict Islamic rule at the same time. And it's it's a fascinating look at a different part of the world that kind of is eye-opening, I think, to Western audiences. So yeah. read, read yeah. Call of Duty stuff. When you look at, like, pictures and stuff from Afghanistan in, like, the 60s and 70s, like, during the 60s and 70s, like, they made huge strides in, like, modernizing and becoming, you know, a lot more Western, I guess. You know, universities, they had cities, they had... right. Cars and Western clothes and universities and movies and yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And women's rights was starting to become a right. popular thing. And then, you know, after this conflict, basically, fundamentalism just, just takes over. And that's that's kind of where, where they're at today. Right. So I guess we could mention, so Charlie Wilson looks like he stayed in Congress for uh, a while after this. He was, it says he was in Congress from 1973 to 1997. He did die mm-hmm. in 2010, just a few years after this movie came out. This is, I mean, this is kind of what he was, I guess, best, best known for. And I guess he was, though, a Democratic congressman from Texas who basically was very, very centrist. If anything, he might have been a center-right Democrat, kind of both by based on what we see in the show and what I would imagine if you're going to be. Yeah, and, and they kind of, you know, play with that in the movie. Like, he's friends with, uh, with Julia Roberts' character, who is like a very right-wing, almost a religious fundamentalist, but for Christianity. Right. But, you know, they they get along basically because they have this shared cause in fighting communism. And uh, she even says, like, she she's talking about uh, Amy Adams' character. She goes, she doesn't like me. She's a liberal. And Charlie Wilson says, I'm a liberal. She goes, not where it counts. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she's a little older than I would have thought. So in 1979, she would have been 50 years old already when the Soviets mm-hmm. invaded Afghanistan. Yeah. You also see, like, they also show kind of his his liberal side when they have the like the guy comes in and and says, hey, the ACLU's making me take down this nativity scene, oh, you know, right. in this in this town. And, and I want you to, like, help me influence the judge to let me keep it up. And he says, you know, no, just just move it to the church. Like, so, you, you know, you, you can they kind of show in the movie he does. Right. He is almost, you know, centrist or even maybe even a little center. Right. But OK. And then uh, the Gust uh, Avocados guy that. Philip Seymour Hoffman plays. What was his actual, basically worked for the CIA, I guess, was his career. Yep. Okay. Yeah. 
and then he died in 05, actually just a couple years before the movie came out. Yeah. Um, but just an interesting, I don't, I don't know what extent, I guess he was as, as that interesting of a character, or if it was more just Philip Seymour Hoffman's portrayal of him. Uh, I think a little bit of both. Um, he is, I guess, he's heavily featured in the book uh charlie wilson's war okay which i think is why he you know then he has such a, a prominent role in the movie just because i think he was a kind of, i mean i haven't read the book but i think he was kind of a character in real life okay so they you know had him be the like the most heavily featured cia guy in in the movie as well well it kind of makes sense so basically essentially you have he's the actual driving force but Tom Hanks's character, Charlie Wilson, is the one that Gus needs to get the money. Like, Gus wants this right. done, but it can't get done without Congress helping. And Charlie becomes that advocate to get Gus what he needs to exactly. actually get this done. Yeah. Yep. And then the movie itself, I was kind of surprised that its only Oscar nomination was Philip Seymour Hoffman. And even its Rotten Tomatoes rating at only, uh, it's an 82%, 73 audience. I don't know for and it's a Mike Nichols movie, which people won't recognize that name as much as they recognize Aaron Sorkin. But I mean, this is the guy who directed The Graduate and Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf and Remains of the Day and Working Girl. Like this guy is a big time director with an Aaron Sorkin script. The movie is really good. I, I don't know why it was so. I guess myself, I didn't have it ranked that high, and it was kind of, I thought it was kind of forgettable. And so I rewatched it and kind of appreciated it more the second time around, I guess. But I don't know. Maybe it's just too small of a story, or the fact that ultimately everything is for nothing. If yeah, we helped get the Soviets out, but then the Taliban just takes over. So it's. But again, that's not about the quality of the film. Right. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, the it, it was kind of a. Um, oh, there's no suspense. You know what's going to happen the whole way, I guess. Yeah, and it's and it's a kind of a heavy hitter year. For movie like this is 2000 this was the movies that came out in 2007 so no country for old men there will be blood you know and then the other the other three here for best director are michael clayton juno and the diving bell and the butterfly which i i mean i i really like charlie wilson's war but i would definitely nominate those movies over charlie wilson's war for director and even for even for screenplay that is something we do talk about a lot that just Okay, well, yeah, in several years, it would have gotten, you know, half a dozen Oscar nominations, but yeah. not in this year, because it was kind of a loaded year in in right. some ways. But And of course, that's a big one, too. Yeah, there's a lot of people who are in the camp of, oh, No Country for Little Men versus There Will Be Blood. Both of those movies would have won Best Picture every year in that decade, yep. but they were the same year. Yep. And like, as far as uh, screenplays go, you know, No Country for Old Men is a is a Coen Brothers screenplay, so you know it's going to hit hard. Plus, it's based on a Cormac McCarthy novel that's also really, really good. And then There Will Be Blood, you know, is a PTA screenplay based on an Upton Sinclair novel that's also really, really good. So I, I don't think any other movie stood a chance as far as a screenplay or a director Oscar that year. And then it ends up with being a vote splitting thing because you'd be like, okay, well, it should be ahead of away from her on the screenplay ad adapted thing. But the voters who would have gone for Sorkin were the voters, the very voters who went for PTA and the Coens. Yeah. I just wanted to um, also point out that so this uh, this conflict, the Soviet Afghan War, is also the reason for the uh, 1980 Olympics boycott. Oh right, yes, by the yes. United States. Yep. So the United States basically there's a, a whole ton of countries that boycotted the Olympics in 1980 because of the Soviet invasion, and then in the 19 I think it's also the 1980 Winter Olympics, which was the miracle on ice when the United States hockey team that's right okay. beat the Soviet hockey team. Um, for for gold at the Winter Olympics, which is a huge deal because the Soviets had won like five out of the last six Olympics. They had won gold, and then the United States comes on and and beats them as like a a moral victory for the United States on the Olympic stage. And then also in then in 1984, the Soviet Union and a bunch of like Eastern Bloc countries all boycotted the 1984 Olympics that was held in the United States. So yeah, it's just you know another uh, you know we try and relate this to uh, to sports this is like a, a big a moment in history for sports with the with the dueling Olympic uh, boycotts and, the, and then the miracle on ice. Right, that that is directly related to because it wasn't just about the Cold War; it was about specifically this invasion no, in was, Afghanistan. Yeah, right. specifically the the Soviet Afghan War is what right. they were protesting. And the Simpsons episode that always comes to mind on the '84 boycott was. Krusty got in some, but basically it's like some Krusty Burger giveaway or something where like free burger if the U.S. wins gold in these events. And they're like, and Krusty's like, well, what, what, that's, we're going to lose our, lose our shirts on this. And they're like, no, 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 don't worry. We picked all the events that the Russians dominate in. 
<laughs> and then the Russians don't show up. And so the U.S. is winning everything and Krusty just loses his butt. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, so that kind of wraps us up with Afghanistan here in the 1980s. And before we get to the end of the Soviet era and the fall of communism and all of that, we are going to go briefly to the South Pacific and look at a sort of Romeo and Juliet romance story that takes place in one of the native tribes in one of the islands just off the coast of Australia in the film Tana. Tana. 